again. Um, tonight, I am going to be sharing screen, uh, a lot of images and things, and talking about the elements and principles of art. I do want to say to start this off that um, these are references you are not expected to know all of these and have to put them in all your paintings and check off the list all the time. But uh, it is a tool that you can go back to and and use. Here's some of the list. I'm going to send this out when I send the video. This is just kind of a quick little review. So you can go back and remind yourself about some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight. Also have a Patreon page that you can sign up for. There's three different levels. One is just some demos, and then there's instructional videos for the next level. And the last level, we get together once a month and go over some of the things we've been working on. So if you're interested in that, um, just let me know. Again, going back to these elements and principles, they're not laws. I mean, they kind of are for art. And this is what you learn when you go to um, an academy or to get your BFA or your MFA. But what you want, what we want to do as artists is, first of all, I have wrote down some notes. You, you want to do what you feel, why you are drawn to paint something Usually we have a moment of inspiration and we want to capture that and you want to express that on the paper. And when we do that, that's our element of that's our act of experimenting and adventuring. And then it's there. And when someone else views it, we have no control over their reaction to it they are going to bring their own experiences and their own life behind them to that painting. And that's a whole new element. So sometimes we get so uptight, we get part, we get inspired and we get going and we get excited about a painting and then we get part way into it. And we're like, Ooh, is somebody going to like this? Or, Ooh, are they going to be able to understand what I'm doing over on this side? Or, Maybe I should make it clearer. Maybe I should make it more realistic or something. And then we start losing that initial excitement and drive as to why we wanted to create it in the first place. What we want to encourage you is create. Don't wait. Create. Get in there. Jump in with your inspiration. Get going with that first excitement and then stop step back. And one great thing to do at that point, give it a little breathing room. You are the artist. That's your creation. It's a separate entity. Then do a trick with it. Turn it upside down. See if it's working that way. Do something unexpected to it and then turn it back over and leave it alone again for a little while. And then the painting starts speaking to us in a sense. I hope you understand what I'm saying, but it's its, it's own entity, I think. And then you start working together in this partnership with what you're creating and your intent. And trying to hold on to your initial intent is a trick. And we're going to talk about that as we go through the night. Um, I know a lot of times we talk about, oh, what are you working on now? You know, what's your work now? What's an artist's work? Why is it work? Why do we call it work? I've started in my classes to call it play. Hey, let's play now because that loosens us up. Once we get work and we start tightening up, we lose what our initial intent is. Not always, but quite often. Um, oh, and don't, I mean, we, we're going to look at other people's artwork. We're going to talk about it, but once you absorb all these different beautiful paintings, you're not going to paint like any of them. You're going to paint like you. You are your own artist. And sometimes I get, I know I do, I get going along and I'm like, oh, gee, I wish this looked more like such and such artist, you know, and then I'd start changing my initial drive and I end off in this other tangential area. And 
I lose my, my focus often and I lose that freshness of the painting. So don't paint like someone else, paint like you. That's already been done. Let's see what you can do. And one way to really do that, and I'm guilty of not doing much lately because of being back and forth to Maine, is just paint. Paint every day, draw every day, do something and just keep it going. And the more you do it, the more natural it's going to become. All of that tightness is going to start flowing away and you're going to start finding your, you know, we talk about finding your voice, maybe finding your voice, but you just keep painting until it becomes more like you. And every now and then I try something different, but you want to find what makes you happy, what expresses your creative spirit. Those are my words. Different people use different words. As I go through this list, and you're looking, you know, we'll talk about it, but then when you go to start a painting, if you want to focus on some of these, maybe choose two or three of these things to work on. Don't try to work on all of them in one painting. Sometimes then when you step back, you can double check things like, oh, something's not working quite, white, quite right, but I'm <laughs> sure what it is. So you go back to your list and go, oh, it's the composition's off. You know, why is that? And then you can examine it. So I am going to start here. There's something in the chat. Polly, I'm not going to get to the chat if you can. I'll be asking questions if they're. Thank you. Um, the first element is line. And line <clears throat> can involve so many aspects. That's one of our first elements. The element of line can be straight. It can be curved angular, diagonal, horizontal, vertical. It can be S lines or X lines. There's so many different ways. And I've chosen a few paintings here that show some artists that use line in a very strong way to define the form. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay. Watch how the lines actually follow the form as this goes, the hollow of the cheek goes in, that goes in over the nose, the highlight of the nose using line very interestingly. All right. This is not. Apologize. I have to make a couple adjustments here. Okay. Degas, wonderful use of line. He's combining his drawing lines into the finished pastel painting. If Degas can call it finished at this stage, why mm -hmm. couldn't he? Right? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm beginning to find that I, I, I look at Polly's paintings and I'm thinking, oh, she's abstract. That's so wonderful. And I have such trouble with abstraction. But if I look at my paintings in the first one or two steps, they're abstract at that stage. Lines can express something. This was rain on the window. And these vertical lines express the field and the trees out behind just by using line. Here's a self-portrait, mostly line drawing energy. It can create energy with all these different diagonal strokes. <clears throat> Tara Will uses line in a thick way. She uses it as if she's doing a woodblock print often. Powerful lines, beautiful. And she has to plan ahead where she's going to make this one work, but you can do it. And then once she gets going, she doesn't worry about it too much. If you've ever seen one of her demos, she is bold and gets right in there. And what if it doesn't work out the first time? You go back, you get another piece of paper, do it again. Line following form, different colors overlapping. That way you have cross hatching, which can create some beautiful color by the other colors showing through. Okay. So that's line. Any thoughts as we're going along? Because I will have to. Um... They're so bold. You know, it's just, there's nothing subtle there, It's but they're beautiful. 
with those the, yeah the the one the field in the rain now that's wonderful that's subtle but the other i mean they're all they're wonderful and so different and this is this is a collection that i have created um i i collect other people's other artists work quite a bit to be inspired um this sorry wow now we're dealing with color so colored this is line but it's also color again the overlapping as the impressionist discovered that when you're doing white you don't do white there's very this is not even white it's a very light yellow and um that's how you convey white is through lines all right i just lost my go ahead all right this color this is there's we'll talk about this i think the fourth week is going to be different color schemes this is a secondary triadic color scheme which means you have your three secondary colors purple orange and green very simply but then you don't want to have them equal in the painting you want to have them in it in it unequally <laughs> they'd be unequal right to create that vision and the purple is still the per there's different types of purples but that is the predominant color oh this is beautiful i as when i put this on slideshow i can't see the artist but i do have the artist names on these look at how this artist used color in the foreground there's yellow there's yellow in the sky so she's tying together the foreground and the sky but with a different intensity here it's very intense, here it's more subtle, and that creates a aerial perspective, the softness that is pushing the sky back in the distance. The same with the purple blue, a soft purple blue back here, and a little hint of um, landscape behind it. But if you get close up, and we're not going to be able to get it because of the pixelation of the picture, but um, this reads as there's some trees and you know houses back there but you don't have to define it all out you don't have to draw a tiny little house and make it absolutely perfect because as we talked about last week the viewer's eye will finish that doing color exercises are great um working with just black and white your analogous colors your complementary colors and Doing these exercises using the same image so you become very familiar with the image and then adjust your color schemes to try different things out and do them small. And you can go look back and I mean, these two down here would make great paintings. I think they work really well. It's a quick way to work out a color scheme for a larger painting. This was one of the paintings at the IAPS um, 2022 show. It won an award. Who would think to do orange and, and fuchsia, you know, behind a train? It's fascinating. Doing something that's a surprise, something that's a little different. It's going around. It outlines this. It pulls together the skyline here. The gray in the mountains ties into the train down here and the tracks. I believe these are tracks down here. Does it matter if they're tracks? No. Not really. And look how he has this little deep blue sign right there. Bam. Usually we don't even notice that at first. Tony Elaine, master with color. He just puts it down. It's bold, very few layers, but very bold and strong layers. Great one to look at for color. So some of these are very pleasing. Look at this. This is AJ Wainwright soft, beautiful color schemes, where if you look back at Tony's, it's bold, it's strong and intense, bright orange highlight right there in the middle where he wants you to focus on these darks, these lights, and that orange. Hers is subtle and soft, and it's large, and she just wants you to drift back and forth across this painting. Beautiful. Thoughts? You're just gonna have me talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> Those were inspiring. It is very inspiring, Terry Lynn. It's just um, so much to take in. So don't 
take the silence as a you know crit right. critical it's we're just thinking yep and you can take notes if you well notes it but you have the video later um our next aspect is composition again this is where i really encourage us to do thumbnails ahead of time especially if you're going to be doing a large painting a thumbnail helps you plan out this is Olga Abramova, she's the president of the Pastel Society of Russia. I love her paintings, partially because I don't paint anything like her, I don't think, you know. She has this soft, beautiful way of, of painting. So if we're looking for composition now, you want a strong composition. What composition has she basically used here? And I always tell my students, you learn the rules so you can bend the rules. She has basically used a triadic division of space for her composition. Then she has placed a primary center of focus here and a secondary down here near the intersection of any two of those lines. Why do I say this is primary? It has the most detail. It has the lightest lights and the darkest darks, and it sits right in the intersection of those two lines. This is secondary, it has darks and lights too, but it's not as bold. Let's go back to the, the first one. When you just kind of close your eyes and you open, where do your eyes go first? That's your primary focus. And if you have trouble with your painting, trying to figure out this for your own painting, stop, walk away from it for a while or something, or turn it upside down. Or sometimes you hold it up in a mirror. Or you can take a picture on your, you know, your phone, and that way you're more objective about it. And then you can hold it and you can turn it upside down and around that way. Trick yourself into creating more interesting art. This is beautiful. Everyone knows who this art of this, I think. <laughs> one of my all-time favorites. This is Lina Selta. She's one of our main artists. Um, this composition is basically one of the S or Z compositions. You can see she has these very strong Z lines going through the painting. And what happens is it draws the viewer up. It's softer here, but it draws it through mm -hmm. this high contrast area. Her perspective is going back. That little stream is getting smaller. Then there's a little line that kind of pulls you this way. Then a soft shadow back to her horizon. Let's go back and look at the other. Can you see it now? It becomes very, very obvious. She's doing this consci consciously on purpose to draw the viewer back into that painting. It invites the viewer into the artwork. Casey Klan, he's going almost very fauvist on his paintings, fauvism, F-A-U-V-I-S-M, was a um, post-impressionist period. This composition, however, is radial. Boom. All of the lines kind of point to the center. And in that center, you have a lighter flower, the bright red flowers there, and one of the darkest darks. But you can also see at this point how those lines are all leading toward that center. Um, this is great. This is kind of a cross composition, simplified. But it's a little asymmetrical as well, which means it's not totally balanced. But it does, it's basically a cross. Terry Lynn, who was that? I'd have to look back when we, um, when I get out of this, I can say, I can't remember right now. I think it might be Deborah Stewart. Sure, sorry. This cat, this is actually, I do remember this. This is Margaret Dyer. This is not Yale Maiman. Curved composition. She has the curves here, she follows that. And then she's got the highest contrast right here near the cat's face, that lightest light, darkest dark. There's no great detail anywhere, but you get this beautiful flow going in. 
Also notice that none of her lines go directly off the corner of the painting. That helps to keep the viewer's eye into the painting. This is Jen Evenhus, and she was working here with strong diagonals. It really emphasizes that mountain scene. She crisscrosses it with some vertical trees. These, this one's strong, but these are a little more subtle down here. But you can see the diagonal. It's beautiful. This is the Fibonacci series. It's a mathematical equation. It comes up a lot in nature. Um, each square, it's this is the equation. I don't understand it totally. I have a general idea. But this is what leads into the golden mean and also helps with the, the division of, well, it, it works into the golden mean. So this is, say, if this is one unit, this is about a half a unit, this is a quarter, this is, so it gets smaller and smaller as it goes around. Here is one example of how it ties into a painting as one of the composition principles. This is Hokusai's, you know, the fisherman going this way. This is very, but you can see how it comes around and it brings that eye into that. I got, I got a groan. I started a new drawing class last week and I told them, yep, there will be math. <laughs> Uh, Casey Klein again, very simple, strong triangle. That's one of your classic compositions. A lot of da Vinci's figures are in the triangle. The Madonna with the baby and the two angels is usually in a triangle. Love this painting. Um, just bold. I love how he, this is all just the paper showing through and the lines there, but this is circles. He's used concentric circles for this composition. So there's all these choices we have, but sometimes we try to include too many things. We need to pick and choose, like we're going out to eat, you can't eat everything, you kind of got to pick and simplify it for yourself. This is more of what they call the steel yard. It's a little asymmetrical, somewhat unbalanced. Obviously, here's your center of interest right here. Very, very nice. That's it on that one. Okay. Any know. questions on composition? Any thoughts? You don't, it doesn't have to be a question. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water. <laughs> I love it yet talking a lot. My, my Scottish complexion starts coming up. Thank you, dad. <laughs> Harry Lynn, the um, discussion of different um, discoveries of composition is very, uh, it's very enlightening. And the history um, of it? Very interesting to see how a painting can take the viewer's attention and direct it. And I think a lot of times, uh, at first, especially, we don't think about that. We're not consciously thinking about it. But as we advanced and, and keep moving, it's, it helps us. It's a wonderful tool to use to help our paintings work better. Yes, that's a great comment. So you're talking about the history of um, compositions? Just seeing what people do is very instructive to me. Okay. I th I'm a visual learner. I think a lot of us are. We are artists. So I like learning by looking at other paintings. So I hope this is helpful. I mean, I could stand at my easel and draw, but let's look at some beautiful artwork. <laughs> the next um, element is edges. And we talk about lost and found edges and uh, sharp and blended edges. Mm -hmm. Make sure this is not going to go anywhere. This is Marla Baguetta. 
line, she's increased line, but her lines are only at the very end. So we look at her composition. She has a strong triangle composition here. She starts painting. She definitely wants us to focus on this rooster's head, which is beautifully and energetically drawn. Look down here at, at the claws on the feet. This just line there, almost like that Degas. And over here, here's a lost edge. Just where do the feathers end and the background begin? Does it matter? No, because she doesn't want our focus there. She wants us to come here. You get up around the eye and the beak. All of a sudden, you have very sharp edges, um, very, very found edges, strong and clear up in this area. And then again, off in these areas, it just kind of fades off. She has a strong edge here but it's not as sharp a focus in this whole area as it is up around the face of the bird. And at the very end, she threw these lines over that. Can you imagine having this beautiful rooster painting and then going, oh, I'm just gonna scribble some lines over it. Mm -hmm. But she did it. And that was her last unexpected element that she put into this painting that helped energize it, I think. Mm -hmm. I love this one. This is in the IAPS show. If you haven't been to IAPS, consider it for 2024. I hadn't been, I, I, last year was my first time. It was wonderful. This is uh, Pierre Bonnard. Again, lost and found edges. Very strong found edges at the edge of the claw foot tub here, right there at this point. But then you get to the body and where's the water and where's the body? It just blends together. It's lost, but she's in water. So she's come like becoming part of the water. And it's it's beautiful. A little bit of an edge at the uh with the water there in the tub, but then the tub and the tiles behind kind of blend together as well. Very little definition between them. And if you squint your eyes down, it becomes abstract almost. I saw this at the, um, it was in Paris. I think it was the Modern Museum of Art and it, it glows. I mean, this is a photograph, but it just, it was like there was a light behind it. Not like those Thomas Kincaid paintings. It was, <laughs> have you ever seen those? They'll put actually sometimes little LED lights behind a Thomas <laughs> Kincaid painting. I'm like, oh, stop. Another Casey, I, I like Casey Klan's um, self-portraits. They're very strong and bold, interesting colors. He's doing, working here on value, like lighter values on this side, darker over here. So it doesn't matter what color he's using, it's the value. But again, you have some very strong edges here, strong. And then in other areas, it just, there is no edge, it just disappears. And if we think about reality, there's no edge to anything. Even if you take a piece of paper, which you can't see, the edge of it seems sharp to us, yes. But if you microscopically look at this, it's not. That's where Leonardo da Vinci came up with the idea for his sfumato drawing, like on um, La Gioconda, uh, what's her name? <laughs> Mona Lisa. <laughs> right so yeah there's no edge there he has softened it because we have stereoscopic vision we have two eyes we're looking and unless you close one eye you're not going to see just one edge you're going to kind of see a blended edge something to think about i like this one too mm. nice strong edges here this, I mean, it's not a strong edge. It's very soft. It does, you can see some edge, but I like how it blends in. So where does she want the focus? Down here. And again, that's almost like if you go back to the composition, it's pretty much in thirds. But she's all, so she's using a number of elements here, a number of our elements. She's got the composition going. She's got the lost and found edges. Her color is another. This is Deborah Stewart, definitely. Um, lost and found edges. Again, she's using the drawing edge and allowing that drawing to show through the painting. That's one thing I love about pastels. It is so versatile. You can underwash it like a watercolor 
just using pastel or actually using watercolor. You can layer colors over so they show through each other. You can allow bits of your drawing to show through. It's so exciting. And I'm thinking you're all excited too because you're here tonight. Lost and found edges. If you squint down on this one, there is some very clear, sharp edges. And then in the shadows, where does the body end and the shadow on the sofa begin? They just kind of blend together. And that's going to help direct the viewer's eye here. Very atmospheric painting, sharp edges. He wants you looking at this wagon that's struck through the snow. The horse kind of blends into the other horse. The building kind of disappears. Even part of the wagon almost disappears. But here, getting those wheels through the snow, that's the story of this one. Thinking about the story, what are we telling? What is our story of a painting? Sorry, this is one of mine. But again, working with lost and found edges. Just some areas blend into whatever, doesn't matter. Keep the focus up here. Even this eye is a softer focus and this is stronger here. Sharper edges, this just kind of blade blends away. I do, I sometimes do birthday paintings. Do you guys ever do those? Like it's birthday time and it's like, okay, time to take no, a good look no, at my- No, but it's a very nice painting, Carolyn. Yeah, yeah. it is. Thank you. Oh, how are we doing in time? Oh, we're doing well, okay. My next element is flow. <laughs> Sorry, mine's maybe an old limerick. <laughs> um, Michael Freeman, very realistic items. This is obviously one about COVID. <laughs> I love the toilet paper and the mask in it. Mm. He is working with what was i talking about i'm sorry what did i say we we're talking the flow of the painting thank you <laughs> how does he keep your eye into this painting it's strong yes this seemingly painted the box is actually part of the painting he does very detailed work <laughs> very beautiful but if we go to the next slide I've kind of shown how he keeps the eye in the painting. So he has these circles. He's got repeated circles in the composition. He has this curve kind of overall of the horns. And then up in this corner, even though it's square, it's going to keep that eye flowing up and around and not escaping from the painting. So. We come in, we look at this skull, we follow this horn, even if it's subconsciously. Up around here, this directs us, this direction, this curve keeps us in here and not going off the corner of the painting. Down around and then this other curve here. So he very skillfully has worked to keep the viewer's eye in the painting. And it might sound like it's something very advanced, but by using some of these simple elements that we've talked about you can, we can all do this just think about it go why is my eye keep wandering off this painting maybe there's something over in the corner that's not holding my eye into the painting maybe i have a line going directly off the corner well i can fix that you know i can vignette it a little bit soften those corners this has a beautiful flow it's a very lyrical painting pastel you can see these gorgeous curves and it just kind of, you come in and you're looking and you flow with it almost like water and come back in and around. And Now this appears, this line could easily, a lot of people could have that branch heading up this way. No, she has it this way, even though it flows kind of this way as well, it stops here, but these are softer. There's not a lot of contrast here. And by taking these two leaves, this leaf, curves and this leaf which is stronger with light on it brings our eye back down and in 
and the same down here. This comes down around, and then generally speaking, the curve of that shadow will bring our eye back into the painting. Tara will. She does a great job keeping our eye in this painting. I can't remember if I analyzed this one. No, I did not. So you could start to see it here. See how she has these curved elements. This is kind of obvious here. Here's our center of interest, obviously. There's a curve here. She made a deliberate choice to keep that light there, bring our eye down around. Here it's softer, but she has, see these very subtle diagonal lines here at the corner that almost, not exactly, but almost flow into these. So it brings us around. And this is even more subtle. It's just a soft curve here of those, those dark greens. That's a very subtle way of going in. This is not a pastel. <laughs> I, I chose mostly pastels. This is N.C. Wyeth, the great illustrator. Um, does a great job coming in. You jump, you immediately kind of go to this light because everything else around it is so dark. It's vignetted. There's a curved corner here. This rock comes around here down to this man's back and this rock, that beach curve, and around even this arm draws us back, keeps us from going off this corner. It draws us back up around to the light. And all of these faces are looking at the light. So every element is looking at that burning ship. Plus the highest contrast right here. I think that's it on this. Yes. N.C. Wyeth is a genius in painting, as are his son and grandson. I read a biography of him once, and I decided I don't think I would like the man, though. <laughs> we have a question uh, in the yes. chat. Uh, Terry, when you paint, are you this analytical as you paint, or do you work out these issues when you stand back? I usually, um, um, oh, good question. If I'm doing a larger painting, I often do uh, some thumb, a number of thumbnail sketches, color sketches. And as I'm doing the thumbnails, that's when I really work on composition. I decide, am I doing by thirds? Am I doing a spiral? Because it's little, it's a small thumbnail, I can do that quickly and make these big decisions early on. And then when I get to my larger work, I can move into that make those first steps into the painting very bold and strong. Um, and then I'll work in it a while, step back. It almost tells me when it's time to step back. When I start picking at something, especially, that's time to step back. I sometimes leave it for a day or two or a couple of weeks. Usually I'm better at doing things fresh, like while it's still, I still have the inspiration and I work quickly. Uh, but then as I'm finishing it, I will consider these things again, the composition, the center of focus. Do I have the most contrast, like in this cat's eye here? See how I, I curve these um, whiskers and seats to keep your eye basically in the painting. These kind of come up this way, the curve of the nose, and it keeps your eye. But that's not what we're talking about here. What was I talking about on this one? Focus. Finding that center of focus. We start building elements one on top of the other sometimes. Again, I've got that curve, so it's almost vignetted. The division of thirds, basically. So this third and that top third, that's basically where the eye is. And that's what I wanted the focus on. The highest contrast is here. The sharpest details, the sharpest edges. Down here, you notice the edges just kind of get smushed off and those lost and found edges. So all of these elements kind of start together. And as you're finishing, that's a good time to step back and really think, is this working? And why is, if it's not, why is it not working the way I want? When you're doing an eye, the little aside, very last thing, you want a couple highlights on that eye. It's, it, you have your cornea there. There's a thickness to it. The iris, the color does not come right up 
flat on the surface of the eyeball, you have a good amount of clear space in between, and you want that highlight floating across that surface. That's going to make it seem more alive. Is this in the right one? Focus, right? Okay, everything's drawn over here. The most detail, the most color is over in this area. That's another simple way of keeping focus. A little touch of highlight over here, but not much. Most of it's this way. I love it when people just leave the paper natural. I, I used to do that a lot. Comes up to here. Even this, if you cover one eye, and I wish I could do this on, but if you cover one eye and then the other, look how different both of those eyes have been handled. Those are both his eyes, obviously, and they're very well structured in the head. And if you're going to do heads, you really need to understand, and it doesn't take long to do it, but understand, you know, the skull and the bone structure and the muscles and think of it as sculpture as well in different planes, but we can talk about that later. Um, but it's strong here. You know, this is sharper. There's more contrast. The focus is in here. If we look at the highlight on these, I see there's a couple of highlights there. This is also highlighted, but it's not with the same brightness. See how this is almost white? And this is a maybe three or four blue. I mean, it's softer. That is purpose, purposeful. That was decided by the artist to push this side of the head and the eye back. Little things like that. Sometimes I'll do it and I'll go, why, why is that back eye popping out at me? And you're, ugh, you know, the same brightness of highlight. I shouldn't have done that. Pick up a soft grayish blue, highlight it that way. Corey Pitkin, this, when he put this one up the first time, it blew me away. It's so simple, these lines. Obviously, this boy is working on a polished dining room table. Lost edges over here, totally lost. I don't know where the bureau starts and the table ends. Oh, who knows? It doesn't matter. But then these reflections, and even though it's reflecting the same thing, it is not the same intensity. Look at those things. This from the book just kind of comes down and it brings, even though it's a flat table, when you're looking at reflections, they come down vertically toward you. And then the loss, the found edges here, so sharp, a little softer toward him. All the focus is in here. I just, this one's masterful to me. Has anyone taken any uh, classes with Corey Pitkin? He, he does classes. Or seen a demo of his? He's very... He thinks every mark he makes, he thinks very well. It's not like me, it's not fast. Focus. This one's interesting because one would think that that gold scarf, which is beautifully rendered, kind of fights with a face, right? Which thing is more important? Well, it's obvious the face is. But the painting in this, to do shiny things, you need contrast. This is like a gold lame scarf of some sort. A lot of contrast. Squint down. You can see the lighter areas to the darker areas. Very different in value, light to dark, where the face is much softer because it's matte. It's soft, and there's less contrast there. And she's got a beautiful circular composition here. The eye just keeps kind of going around and around. And notice even this that almost goes off the corner. Look how she softened it down here. I think it's a she. I'm sorry. So your eye doesn't really go off. Almost, but not quite. A little catch on that. All right. Now, again, I'm not going to do all of these all the time, but now you're beginning to, it's like building a vocabulary. We're getting, even before the vocabulary, we're learning the A, Bs, and Cs here. You know, we're just our alphabetical stuff starting out. 
I have to back out. Form. Okay. Form. Strong forms. Again, if we, oh goodness, here I did it again. If we come down to the very basic shapes of this, see, what are we looking at? We're looking at kind of a triangle here, a thin strip up there, a smaller triangle here, and a large light triangle there. Those forms, those shapes are strong in this. And that, if you did a little thumbnail, you'd figure that out, and then you can bring it over to your larger painting. A trick is sometimes that people will do the thumbnails, they're coming out really well, and they get it over to the large painting, and something else takes over, some evil spirit takes over, <laughs> and, and they lose that initial strong composition. If you need to even measure it out a little bit, okay, this dark's going to come, you know, a little more than halfway down over here. Same here. This is going to come, where is that on the paper, you know? And, and make marks on your big paper so you keep that strong form that you had planned out and started with. Another strong forms, shapes. Here's another circular pattern, circle, circle, another oval here. Let's look at this smaller. What's this dark stripe up here? Anybody know? I don't know. Does it matter? But without it, if he just had a flat blue across that back, it would not work the same. So these even sometimes random shapes, because Casey always sits right on the edge of, you can recognize things like a, a fruit in a bowl, but it's almost abstract too. I love that teeter-tottering that he does with his works. These are some strong forms. That's why I started this. Diagonal, diagonal, diagonal. You know, and progressively going back. So I have these rectangular shapes here, this big one, this one, and smaller. So it's a repeated rectangular shape going in the same direction. This just got into the Red Rock show. I was really happy, so. Polly, I thought of you when I was doing this one. <laughs> I was like, I want to do this figure and I want to do it as almost abstract as possible. And it's a little different than, you know, for me. So, but it was fun. This was a trick down here. This line that goes across the road where it catches the light. And then when it's in the shadow, how that changes. I call this second cup because I have no idea why this guy has two cups. He only had one chair sitting there by himself. <laughs> here forms, shapes, repeated rectangles makes up this painting. And then the artist cuts across it very subtly with these diagonal lines. Again, best way to figure out the forms for this is with a thumbnail. Push it down. Terry Lynn, question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. When you were working out, you know, that image of the man in the chair was pretty fascinating and very different. And did you work out that as, it, I mean, did you set your basic composition and then work out the um, unusual elements of it as you? we're painting it. I mean, you didn't know exactly how that would turn out when you started no. out. I know with that piece, I did a quick little thumbnail from a photograph I had taken. It was a social street affair, you know, or something. And I did a quick little thumbnail and I know I wanted very simple elements. Actually mm -hmm. the background, there were a lot of figures in the background. I decided to leave those out and just do some vertical. If you remember that. Um, so initially it was somewhat intuitive, but then I had to bring it in. And I worked the most on the road in the foreground. Which was the simplest part. 
which would seem to be the simplest part. But that had to be just right. And it took me a while to figure out, oh, those repeating rectangles, those repeating diagonal rectangles, that's what I had to focus on and make it work. And I started, uh, that's a 12 by 18. I started with pan pastels and I use with my pan pastels that large, I don't have one right here, the, the, the largest sponge that they have. I like that big mark that it makes simplifies form and that's what i'm that's what i was looking for there i hope did that kind of answer your question mary beth yes great it's just just you know there are so many things to think about when we have a talk like this and i'm thinking okay there's no way i can juggle all these elements in my mind as i'm setting up a painting so you have to zero in on what pulls you and then make that somehow most compelling to your viewer right yes yes you you need i start with one or two elements like what's my basic composition am i going division of thirds am i doing circular you know kind of generally that and i do it on the little thumbnail it's quick to do it that way you don't have to worry about doing it in a large painting and then what's my next thing often it's either value do i want this very tonalistic and very similar in value all over do i want high contrast so i pick and choose maybe two or three to start the painting and then as i go on i often um focus on some of the other elements but you can't I mean, kind of all the elements are included in it, but trying to focus on all those every time is not going to do it. That yeah. will drive you crazy. Yeah. See, I've gone out of this twice, and I keep now I've forgotten what my theme was on this one. <laughs> I keep doing this harmony. <laughs> okay. Oops. Harmony in a painting. Even how do you get all these different elements to kind of work? together you want a cohesive painting yes you can have it very contrasty a lot of detail or something very soft like this but it needs to harmonize with itself it needs to be in keeping i think this one is beautiful he's kind of come across this he came i'll have to look up his name i think it's brian um he was doing a model one day who was a little self-conscious. She had modeled for groups, but she'd never modeled for like a single person. So he covered her with this gauze. And he has now, this has kind of become one of his styles, is covering things with beautiful gauze and painting through them. I don't know. I, have, I did not see his demo, but I have a feeling he paints like the fruit first and then paints the gauze over. But he must have an idea where that's going to go. Notice his lines never go off the corner. <clears throat> but the softness of the peach and the softness of the gauze all works together very nicely here. This, even though there's soft <clears throat> blended and horizontal strokes mostly up here, and then these short, almost Van Gogh type energetic strokes down here, this painting is very much in keeping with itself. It harmonizes. What's happening down here harmonizes with what's up there. Look, left the paper again. Looks like you are to me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're fairly new, ask other artists what their some of their favorite papers are. And remember that Dakota pastel.com, you can buy samples of papers and samples of pastels if you're not sure which direction you want to go in but again if you have pastel friends a lot of times they share i know mary beth is one that's wonderful to share polish and we all share this is very much nicely in keeping with itself richard mckinley he came and did a demo what year was that 20 2018 18 i didn't get to that i think i was fairly new in this society I'm going to zoom this down again, even small. Look how well that works. 
It's a division of thirds, but he's pushed it a little further. That's not exactly third. It's down a little further. Warm area here, warm area there, warm. So this warm is kind of floating through this painting and see how it works on that nice almost S curve. The darker areas almost work like a cross composition here, these dark. Excuse me, Terry Lynn, we got a question from yeah. Rosalind. She wants to know what is the best way to te test out those Dakota paper samples to compare them? The best way? Yeah, how, what's the best yeah. way to compare them? You just what make it, small paintings or- I would do, paintings? yeah. I, th I think the samples come fairly small and then you can try, I would try the same or similar subjects, something you're comfortable with, like a flower or something simple, and just use the same pastels and the same, sometimes you can just line a few up and do one, two, three, four, and see how it reacts to the um, paper. Of course, different pastels are going to react differently on different papers as well. So I would use the same pastel all the way across to see each one. Thank you. Has anyone tried the uh, Lux Archival yet? Mm. No answer on that, but um, I, there's another question. Um, I recognize harmony when I see it, but how is it best achieved? How to do it? Yep. Mm. That's, that's a wonderful question. A lot of it is experience. <laughs> and often, <laughs> I have to say, you know, just keep painting and painting and painting. I find if I put a paint, if I'm sh not sure a painting is working and I set it aside for a few days and pull it back out, maybe turn it upside down with that fresh eye, often I will see what was not quite working or if it is working. Does that make sense? Just giving ourselves a little vacation, a little hiatus from a work and then coming back to it, we see it as if we are more objective we are not as involved when we're working on it we are so involved in it give yourself some space give the painting some space in a little while and come back and another thing is ask some trusted friends especially if you're starting out a trusted friend or mentor really really can help Hope that answers the question. That's my thoughts. These are my thoughts. She says it seems like color is more <clears throat> important to harmony than composition, but is that actually true? Oh, it's all important. <laughs> um, and harmony, the composition is very subtle. Like this one, his composition is very subtle. Same there. Um, this, this is a Dega. That composition is. That's a Z. So you've got like that Z composition here. Uh, Christine wants to know, she has used Ar Lux Archival um, and she thinks it's nice paper, but she wondered if she could use liquid on it without it buckling or curling. Yes, 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 yes. Which is why I love Lux Archival. Um, if you know, and UART is my workhorse, but it slightly curls at the edges. It's almost impossible to get it not to curl. And if you're painting near the edge, your pastel will catch that. Lux Archival doesn't do that. I use a lot of liquids. Um, as I told the story last month that, you know, I was doing a demo and one day I sprayed it with alcohol and it was one of the papers that didn't take liquids and the whole thing turned to mud. <laughs> mm. Not just visually. I mean, it actually dissolved the glue that was holding the, the grit onto the paper. Uh, Lux Archival is, doesn't do that. Not that I've come across yet. And I usually... I, really, I usually work my papers. You've seen my textured paintings and stuff to get crazy. Um, harmony. So this is kind of in keeping with itself by the colors. He pulls the colors together. Um, the flow of the composition. I love how the horses kind of blend together back here. Does it really matter? There's a number of them back there. This is Degas. He used to work in a lot of bright colors. I think I mentioned last week I had learned at the um, at IAPS, they discovered that he used to work like sometimes on a lime colored paper, a chartreuse paper, hmm. but the paper has faded over the, uh, you know, decades. And uh, 
but so it shows when they take it out of the frame and that little edge, but it's still beautiful on now what is a grayed paper, but some of those dyes are not permanent and it, it changed on him. So I think this is, that's really beautiful. Um, harmony. What's the opposite? This is, this is not really harmony, is it? That's a strong thing too. He's like, Ooh, this doesn't really, it, it's in keeping with itself because of the way he's handling the pastels and the marks. But look at the contrast of this. I mean, this is a strong statement. This is kind of a opposite, like not really harmonizing, but working very well. Okay. I'm out of buttons. I, I see no buttons here. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of buttons. Where'd they go? People have great questions. I, these are great things for discussions, which is often why I like to, um, like in, in my group, my uh, Patreon group that meets once a month, we will discuss paintings, what people have been trying and what's working and maybe what's not working so much. Whoops, what happened here? All right, this one popped up multiple windows. the moment i've lost my zoom window there it is all right um planning keeping your intent how once do we once we do something do we keep that original intent that i was talking about at the beginning you know, you, you're inspired by something, the, something captures, and that's where your sketchbook comes in. If you've made sketches and you do uh, keep notes of where, if you're out on location and you keep notes like sunny day, bright light on the water, dark trees in front, light, you know, make notes to yourself. So you mm -hmm. go back and, and you're painting and that will help you return to that initial inspiration, your initial intent. And as I've been saying throughout this, how sometimes do we hold on to that initial intent? I write notes and I'll stick them. I've got notes right here on my computer. It says slow and clear <laughs> to remind myself to speak slowly and clearly. So I, I'll do that on my easel. I'll put notes up and about what my intent of this painting is. Again, as we get busy and involved in the painting, we often forget what we were planning to do with this thing. And then we get caught up in the details and all of a sudden it's taken this whole new direction. How do you pull it back? This is something I've done since way back. Um, this is back when I was doing a lot of oil painting. So Little thumbnail sketch, again, about two by three inches, planning out quickly. I was young when I did this. Um, from my photo, here was the photo. I've also been in this location. I tried to change the composition a little bit where the water lily pads are going back. Then I planned out a color scheme. You know, I told myself I wanted high key, I wanted reflecting. It's basically my, these were my analogous colors and I was going to accent it with some of these triadic, I called them discords. Notice I spelled chords back then, like chords in a piano. <laughs> but then I did a color study. So I start with a photo, a black and white sketch for my composition, a color analysis, and then a color study. And this was the finished painting, which was about, you know, two by three feet or three by four feet. I can't remember, it was large sold that one. Again, here, uh, a photograph, a quick, look how quick this little um, thumbnail is down here, just my general design. And coming in, I mean, from the design to the color study, I wanted high key, soft, and I wanted it warm, even though it's winter. Here's my little color thumbnail. And this is a poor photograph of the finished painting. Again, it was a very large well, there it is, 24 by 30 inch oil painting. 
but little notes like this, something that you can, that will help you hold on to your intent, whatever it takes. Talk to other people. How do they hold on to their intent? And everybody has different ways. This is some Tony Elaine. He started out with sketch. He does this very soft in the background, strong, bold strokes. His next step, bam. But he knows he had it planned out and where he's going. There's that orange. And look, it looks so strong at this stage. But by the time he got to the finish, it had been toned down by the fact that there were more intense colors around it. I always loved this lime green that he put across the top of the water. So finding tricks for yourself to maintain your original intent in your painting. Otherwise, we get caught up in those little details. And how do you avoid being intimidated? I can't see the rest of the comment. What's the rest of the comment? My expensive paper. They sometimes oh. do better on inexpensive paper because they're not trying so hard and then therefore they stay looser. Exactly. Um, totally understand that. Here, when I'm just going to be doing quick sketches, like a 20 minute sketch or a quick demo, I have some 1000 grain, what is that? The 1000 grade sandpaper. <laughs> I'll do sketches on sandpaper that you can get. Uh, often hardware stores don't have it. That that That's the kind of polishing sandpaper that you can get. And I'll paint on that. I'm not going to sell it, but well, you could. I mean, Jamie Wyeth draws on cardboard, you know, so when he, they're in museums. Um, so what a trick for me that I've learned because I've been, sometimes we become very cost conscious, is mixing in the papers so you don't know which one is which. <laughs> so you kind of fool yourself. I remember doing that once and I did a painting and it came, I'm like, wow, that came out really well. And then I turned the paper over, I'm like, oh, you know, I was saving this paper. I was saving this paper for this great painting. And, and because I didn't worry about it, the painting came out very well. And I didn't even know it was on the expensive paper. And it might have come out better because it was on the expensive paper. Right. And I wasn't uptight about it. But if I'd been uptight about it, that if we get tense or uptight, it comes out in the painting, I believe. We're creating. It's, our, it's part of us. It's and a lot of the paper you can just wash off and try again. That's why I get the papers that you can wash off and try again. I, I have some papers that I've used three times already. So, or board, if you, if you finish your own board. And sometimes you have really nice underpaintings underneath after you wipe down those, the ones that didn't come out that well. Oh, somebody wants to know how you uh, uh, reuse paper. All right. If there's a lot of pastel on it, the first thing I do is take it outside and I get a newspaper or something and I scrape off my pastel. Uh, the, the, whoops, sorry. The majority of it, because I save my dust to make new pastel sticks. When most of it is off and you want to do it outside or, and, or with a mask on, then I take usually alcohol. I use alcohol often because two things, it dries faster and it also helps set that pastel that's left over into the paper, down into the, the texture of the paper. And then you have a nice underpainting. Orientation. The way you decide on your painting, what, how it's oriented, is it going to be long? and thin? Is it going to be tall, thin? Is it going to be more standard size? Like uh, the computer screen or TV screen? Is it going to be portrait like our phones? Is it going to be square? There are different reasons for creating different orientations. If you want a painting like this beautiful one to feel expansive and you want the viewer to feel that it goes out you want the orientation to complement that intent. So by spreading this out, it does that. 
This one is a diptych, which means just means two paintings put together. But it's they wanted that feeling of desolation on a huge plain. Or who knows what this is, water. It's is it water? Is it sand? I don't know. Does it matter? It's beautiful. Squint down. It's a beautiful abstract painting as well, but it's long and thin to give that feeling of ongoing expanse. This, and this artist is wonderful with her orientations, the way she decides what way things are going to go. She wanted the feeling of the trees reaching up to the sky. And if you did this in a regular size format, a regular ratio, like two to three or three to four, you're not going to get that feeling of the height of those trees. So how do you help? What element is going to help you convey that? I mean, obviously the trees, but a long, high orientation on it. Waves are a great thing. You want the whole wave. I don't want you focusing on the sky or the rocks below. I want you focusing on my wave. That's it. Boom, straight across the wave. This one I just think is great. This looks like this is Tara Will, and she I think she just did a quick little sketch. Vertical. And look how wonderful that was. Look at this red line right here. Oh, my gosh. That's genius. <clears throat> it's genius. But this would not have the same feeling if it were in the shape of your phone or something. Long and thin. So if you have little scraps of paper <clears throat> left over from other papers that you've cut down, for an orientation, you could do something like this. Nice little sketches. Mm. And what this wonderful artist always says, this is Lynn, that um, you're not going to frame and sell all your paintings anyway. So do the right thing for the paintings. It's going to be more to frame something that's a non-standard size. Yes, mm. but it's going to be a much more effective painting. She's like, bite the bullet. You know what I do? The wonderful thing we have today is I do sell a lot of my work through my website online. And then I send the painting off with framing instructions. I give them a couple ideas of how they can frame and then they go off and frame it. Um, perspective. I love perspective. Look at this perspective. I've tried this a few times. What? looking down on water from above with rocks. How do you get that feeling? This is not easy. How does this artist do it? Number of ways. These swirls in the water are obviously, we are looking at them from above because they're like circles. And as you know, as a circle gets more closer to your, vent, uh, your horizon, which is your eye level, it's gonna become more of a straight line. Or if you're looking down on it, it's it's a circle. Um, the rocks down here have smaller, tighter lines. She's also using color here to push that away. As you come up, there are larger shapes in this area with warmer colors. Generally speaking, cool recedes and warm advances. So she's using a number of ways. It's the warmth, the size of the elements, cooler, smaller elements as you go down, the perspective looking down on circles of water. And she's making you focus by using a square format. Boom. This is what I want you looking at. Not expansive, not tall and skinny, right here. I want your vision right here. I don't know why that one came up individually. Sorry. Um, see, I've lost, I've lost my, my brain skinning. People need to say something. What am I talking about? Perspective. Perspective. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is Carol Strock Watson. She's as beautiful things. Nice perspective. She's got the, the railroads lying down, 
Notice if you go back, we want to think how railroad tracks look. They look like this, but when they get back in the distance, they're just a line. They're just a line. Exaggerate that perspective also through the size of the buildings as they go back and the intensity. Here's her lightest light, darkest dark here. Things are going back, softer, more aerial, A-E-R-I-A-L, that aerial perspective which is created by atmosphere. There's more moisture and atmosphere between us and what's in the distance rather than what's up close to us. Perspective, looking down on water, the closer rocks, sharp details. You can start now to see some of these elements we've been talking about. What is the artist's perspective here? They want you looking down into this water. You're not looking really across at it. You're looking down into it. And she's done this so well. And then as it goes off in the distance, it fades into the background. More line, more contrast down here, more detail. Back here, just ethereal stuff happening back in the background. See how the artist can... <laughs> We can make people do things. We can make them see things if we do it right. Perspective. You want to feel this woman is like intimidating. So you're down below her looking up and exaggerating the perspective of looking up at her. This was all almost all uh, pan pastel. Perspective. This one I call um, gull, seagull view. I didn't have a drone or anything. I have just drawn Pemaquid so many times. I thought I can imagine what this looks like from above. So I got my little Monopoly houses down here, you know, and just the different views looking down on something as that first one was. And then the horizon just fades off into the distance. The perspective, and I'm not talking linear perspective here. This is a perspective of the artist, how they want you to feel by the way they present the subject of their painting. This one, you want to feel like this clam digger is just imposing. And it's almost like, like you're a clam and you're down below and he's coming at you. Strong, powerful, beautiful painting. It's good to draw things at a different perspective sometimes not the way we typically see things. Jacob Aguiar, perspective. This is bringing in more linear perspective, that curve back. <clears throat> it has some linear perspective, also some aerial perspective going back. I like this, getting close and personal with this man. Look how small his ear is compared exaggerated perspective it's wonderful nancy king mertz doing her l trains in chicago strong linear perspective some linear perspective also the aerial perspective more contrast and color and brightness up front softer to go back in the distance It was stunning. Yeah, you were all, I away, it all in. I love looking at other people's yeah. artwork and and kind of analyzing them and stuff. You want to um, scale. Scale. scale, scale. So the size of things, yes, it kind of works in perspective, but also the size of things as they go into the background. Here, the boats up close are large. If you're doing it, if you measured the size of this boat compared to the size of the boats in the background visually huge difference look this boat here is about the size of this man's head and i think a lot of people starting out don't think about that go ahead and exaggerate it there is a formula to do it and i'll cover that quickly during the perspective week is that next week i think that's next week <clears throat> month. Next, month. next month i mean yes um but yes so get a good idea take a photo photo Photography is tricky. We work a lot with photos, but oftentimes it kind of lies to us. The eye does not see the same way that the camera sees. 
And we want to paint more, not just what we see, but how we feel about something. So we, if you want this to feel like it's a big harbor and it's in the distance, you need to exaggerate that um, scale here. The size, you would not, if this person had painted this tapestry, you wouldn't know the size of it. By putting a human figure in there, it gives it scale. You have something to relate it to. Mm -hmm. How far away is this last boat? Quite a bit because of the different sizes of the boats as they go back. Scale, exaggerate it. The more you exaggerate it, the more intense it is. This, I love this Sally Strand piece. It's a painting of her son at the beach. Looks like so much like an NCYF to me. Mm. But <clears throat> the feeling, she's so close to him, but then there's this huge cloud behind him. And uh, the scale that he's as big as the cloud gives him an importance. It's just wonderfully painted. She also has repeated forms. Here's kind of, if you notice, the cloud is almost kind of in the, the shape of a face. Interesting, huh? People don't usually notice that, like people that haven't studied. I love the scale of this one. Whoa. How are you going to make you feel like this man is just in the sun and he's lying there? Look at the angle that she's chosen. She's down at this. This is her eye level right here because this curves up. So you can tell that she's sitting down at this level and just looking right up at this guy and that scale makes him seem very large and imposing. Fantastic. So much. Shapes. Lots of squares, repeated squares. Works very nicely. Ha <laughs> ha, Polly. Ha uh ha. -huh. Look at these shapes, these triangles, these diagonals and verticals, and she's worked them well together. And by working not just the shapes, but by the colors she's using to draw your eye back and into the painting to this element back here. I, that's beautiful. Just wonderful. Mine, oh, I already showed this one, sorry. But the shapes drawing back, we talked about that one before. Square shapes, very distinctive, almost geometric, simple shapes, oval shapes. Look how real that avocado looks. That is just wonderful. Using your shapes to help. This, again, you don't notice it so much, but if I make it small, again, triangle, triangle, larger triangle. The triangles are all different size. This little star shape in the middle, this dark star shape. Simple composition, powerful painting. It would be tempting to add more dark, you know, lines over here and details. Don't do it. It's working this way. Simple, simple shapes to express what they what they're creating here. This is very flat because the yellow here is as bright as the yellow back there. So it flattens the picture plane instead of creating great depth with aerial perspective, it brings everything up more immediate. There is some linear perspective here that the figures in the foreground are larger than the ones in the background, but because of the color, it makes it flatter. This, I just... Look at these shapes, just simple shapes. So beautifully designed and they're irregular in size. They're not all the same size here. You have this large curve, this one, and a smaller here. Energy, beautiful. We talk about repeated shapes. Boats, not exactly. They're all at a different orientation. This one's coming at us. This is almost straight on. This is more sideways. but they're kind of repeated and these are grouped shapes. Works very, very well. Bring it down, this large shape here, this triangular shape there, and that gray in the background. If it works well small, it should work well large. And try to maintain that original sketch that you've had planned out. Simple shapes, 
you know exactly what this is. No doubt at all. With just a couple simple silhouettes and some vertical lines, everyone knows it's Venice. Again, you don't have, we can't do everything all at once and we need to pick and choose often what works. But if something doesn't work, then we can go and kind of go down through the list and say, oh, why isn't this working? Oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's such and such. So space, the way these elements are stuck together so tightly, there's very little space in this. And I don't mean just between the elements, but also it's very shallow picture plane. There's not a lot of distance between this front cloth and the back wall. And we get that feeling by the way the artist has painted this. Where this one has much more space. You feel like you're being drawn way, way into the background. The same with this Chilhasam. Strong and you're being pulled back <laughs> by these triangles into the background. Space around it. Just you can feel the space. I like that. I love this Degas. This is a Boston, I think. Um, and you can see when you get close, he's either folded or, or added paper on. I remember looking at it when I was, you know how artists get in trouble at museums because we're so close to the painting. Like, how did the artist do that? And we're looking very carefully and the guard is like, step back from the painting, lady. Um, <laughs> very, very beautiful shapes here, very strong. And then in the space around it here, it's a resting spot. He's allowed us to have these resting spots for our eye because it gets too busy and some artists do that. Sometimes it's too much. So it's nice to have some soft resting areas. <laughs> um, spice, doing something fun and unexpected. Um, <clears throat> This is one of the first ones I, I got into an inter, it was the first one I got into an international show actually. I don't have no idea why I did these vertical swashes here. I was doing the rocks, Pemaquid obviously, did the, and then all of a sudden I just went zip, zip, and I did these vertical strokes. I don't know why, it felt good, it worked. And that's one of the things the judge talked about. This is a little bit unexpected, beautiful portrait, but this blue of this hair is electric chest it almost fights with her her expression but it also gives her a halo homer i always have to use homer for the spice thing because he uses these beautiful panes and blue grays and then he adds this cadmium red just a little bit to spice it up if those weren't there those reds the blue would not be as blue by contrast the red makes the blue bluer Yale Maimon, her spice, look at those eyes. No cat's eyes are that yellow, but it works because she has so much of this blue around and then that surprise is bam, that yellow and that orange mark right there. Olga Abramova again, the, the Russian artist, just all this softness is what makes this red in more intense. So if you want something to be brighter, you have to add more dark around it. If you want it to see more red, you have to add softer of the complement around it. That's how the spice is going to work best. I did this. This I thought was kind of fun. I know this is, I love this painting. And this person did it analogous like this on purpose. But I thought, what if you added a little spice of a complement in there? Like that. It makes it a totally different painting. You know, if there were some flowers or something there. Mm. <clears throat> so with some of the tools we have today, you can do that. I just did that on Procreate. It was quick and easy. Just kind of played with it. Um, if you're not sure of wanting to do something, um, try it out on one of the apps that we have on a phone or something. Value. Value is powerful. Value comes over color. 
it's more important to have strong values in your painting than it is to have strong color. But the color will work with the value. Notice here, all of these areas, it's dark, beautiful dark. And that's what makes the sparkle sparkle is all of this dark. But within the dark, you have many different colors. You know, this green, this blue, this purple and stuff in here. But they're all basically the same value. And all the colors up here in the sky and in the reflection, many different colors, all the same value. This is a contrasting piece, high value here, dark, uh, low value there, becomes um, like a jigsaw puzzle, very strong. I love this value, it's just very light overall and you get that feeling that this lighthouse is in bright sunlight. This is not Maine right now, this is Bass Harbor in the summertime. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I love this piece. I really do. Um, soft value. So you're almost what they call tonalism, where everything's very soft and very close in value. You're not going from your one white to your black 10. You're much more narrow in your value scale when you do a painting like this, say from three to six or seven. <clears throat> I hope you all understand when I'm talking numbers of value. Another Sally Strand, a lot of mid-tone values here and just a little bit of bright value to pop out where the light is hitting those elements. Very effective. This is Carol uh, Wasson again, light. I looked at this painting. This thing's huge. It's about four by five feet. And it was I was in front of it for quite a while before I saw the building back here. I, I didn't even see the building at the beginning. All of the textures and the overlying mounts in there are beautiful. <laughs> High key, beautiful. Yes? I thought somebody said something. I think that's it on this one. All right. I know we're getting tired. I can hear people leaving. So I wanted to um, talk about having fun with with painting Let's see if I can get this at the end yeah so one aspect that we really want to do I think I want to do anyway is have fun with painting look at this you know sometimes we get I go through shows like you see shows online and you walk through them and they're all landscapes and seascapes and some portraits and it's you know still lifes and stuff it's like then you come across something like this it's like who would have thunk you know she just got bold the artist went out there and just painted this again this is there's that's all one color that could just be the paper maybe but with these tattoos and everything I mean what a wonderful expressive fun mm -hmm. painting this one is fun. It looks very serious. But on the other hand, those little marks are just all over. And it's like this person's in the matrix or something. And it's expressive and beautiful. And this is one of mine. I had fun with this. I saw this expression. This girl got hit with snow. And I'm like, I want to capture that expression. <laughs> but it's not a serious painting. Well, who cares? This is fun. Where are these circles and hexagons coming from? I, I don't know. <clears throat> So neat in this water with these beautiful leaves. So think about it. You've done this beautiful painting of leaves and wonderful water. And hey, I just think I'll put a circle in here. <laughs> of course, you notice that the circle is not all the same. See the red changes down here. So it's not a flat circle, but <clears throat> Casey went through a whole year of, I think it was the beginning of COVID doing cell portraits. Great exercise. You want to try different papers or different styles. Do some self-portraits. It's one of the hardest things to do, and it's going to improve your painting so quickly. Hmm. This is fun. I have saw the first time I saw this was in person. This is Laura Pollock. She has layers of um, board that she has put grit on, like pumice gel or something. So this underlayer 
there's one layer there, there's a second layer there, and there's a third layer here. And she's put spacers in between. And then she punched the holes here. She has added copper wire here. It becomes a relief, but it's all pastel except for that copper wire. And this dark line here is not painted, that's the shadow. But this light, this, this is painted. Have fun. Try something totally different. You never know. Paint something that nobody else would paint. Tootsie rolls. <laughs> oh, Michael. If you're doing a portrait, I love this. Carol Peebles. Where did this little fairy come from? I don't know. And she's touching the lady right on the nose. Beautiful, classic portrait. And then this fun element of a fairy. Toys. Look at these little guys. And I like this. This is fun again, too. It's just, yep, there's a guy sitting on the beach. <clears throat> not your not your classic kind of portrait, but you know, how great is this? Yeah. This, how much fun was this one? Ah. We have a couple of artists in the Pastel Society of Maine who will do things like this. Love it. Isn't that beautiful? I love this. Just fun. And you, and you look at it and you know exactly what it, what it is. It's so abstract. And just, but they didn't get worried about detail. They got their feeling across and they left it. That's why it's wonderful when you're painting with somebody that you trust and, and they say, stop. Polly did that to me once. She said, stop. Don't you dare touch that painting. <laughs> Don't you dare touch that painting. And, and it got into, helped get me into PSA. So what can I say? Polly was right. So sometimes having trusted friends and mentors around makes such a difference. I was at the gym yesterday morning. I think it was yesterday. And uh, one of the screens was out. So I recorded it. And I'm like, look at these color possibilities. So I could, I could pause it. I could use this color scheme. What a great way to find a color scheme. Play, play with life. Look around. Something inspires you, grab it. You never know when you're going to be able to, to use it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Oh, Hugh, I'm sorry. Thank you for being so patient. Um, there's a lot to this. And I, I just, I hope you like the walkthrough with me and talking about different elements and principles of art and, you know, dividing them down into details. I will send out some information. So for those of you that are um, fairly new, get bold. We will encourage you because that's the best way to learn and to improve your art is to just work our little butts off, paint away, get friends, get encouraged, try getting into shows. You learn so much by being accepted or not accepted into shows and um, just keep doing it. Keep going. All right. So this is um, tension. Look at you guys. It's like, we want more. <laughs> Ooh, all right yeah wow -y. yeah bella tark say see i had all the names but once i go into the slideshow that's it doesn't really cool so uh, that's great tension i love i'm gonna do it anyway because it shows better yeah isn't that wonderful yeah i mean and it does you feel the tension this is one of my what the tension of like that inverted triangle just makes the house always feel precariously on this on a cliff hmm. tension here just by the the crisscross of of lines and that's fabulous yeah i love that and this i was going to talk about the tension i mean it seems very relaxed but there's a tension here because we're he's losing all that water out of his hand and you can feel that doesn't it make you feel a little like, no, no, hold on to it. Hold on to it. Mm. I love that. Um, yeah. Live there. Those Chinese are just amazing. amazing. 
Um, that, that was a um, tension. I would call it, yeah. And, and on the number of these paintings, you can pull out multiple elements, right? I mean, I, there was more like that last one. Had oh, huh? Design. huh? Oh, full. It was, it was like brimming. It was, it was hard to, um, we, we want to get texture still. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. All right. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Get that. Uh, I love that. That's marvelous. That uh, is. That's wild. Ooh. That's cool texture, too. Soft. Mm. There's a, this was an accidental texture. I did this one and I, I sold it, but I have, I don't even know how I did all those little, it was mm -hmm. alcohol or something, but it did a resist yeah. up in here. And then I just followed with my pencil, all the little natural lines that occurred. And then this one, which is the light shining through this hat. This was pretty deliberate, right? This was very deliberate. Yeah. And I actually had to, to get rid of, so I, I did too much at first. Yeah, I was following the photo too closely. This is Lorinda's beautiful textures. But see, here's a nice resting spot over here. It's like she, yeah. she had those drips, but she washed those out. Yeah. She is so good. Same with Olga. Wow. Yeah. This guy. He this used I love. This what? I love this. I he does this. He uses this wide weave gauze, and then he 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 kind of paints over it, and then washes it into the gauze, and then paints in between the little squares. Do you know who this is? Yeah, not off the top of my head. I, I saw this at IAPS. Okay. Yeah. And this, of course, texture, that's the brush texture and stuff. I think that's the last one there. But um, that is M. Price, Michael Price, Spring Forms. He, he does a whole series like that. Value, variety. It's, it's interesting to see someone using uh, like a multimedia sort of thing going on there oh bf reed yeah oh i like bf have you met her oh yeah she's a sweetheart yeah but i she love is the detailed isn't she yeah she she loves it and i love how she put the sky like it's it's on glass on a mirror so it's reflecting the sky up above yeah i know i tend to go for the more impressionistic stuff but i wanted to so he, um, no, um, isn't this Eileen? Yes. Eileen, Eileen yeah. Kate. Yeah. Am I hearing crickets in your background? No. Mm -mm. Okay. I always like. I love this one that Bernadette did. I just this is just marvelous. Yeah. Oh, so fun. Bernadette's work. This is nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, what's her name? Chuck Susan Lee and Aline, of course. I love yeah. that. 